Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, my name is Sevan. I'm going to give you a talk about uh, the NetBSD project and how it might be of interest to you if you have a lot of old hardware around and you want to do something um, with modern software. Um, so a quick intro about why you might want to do this. Um, you may have a lot of old hardware and uh, we have uh, different operating systems and if you want to test something across uh, your different systems, um, this provides you a consistent environment uh, regardless of the hardware that you want to try. Um, gives you the opportunity to kind of test an idea across the board from something as old as a VAX to something more modern, say a PDA running um, on an ARM uh, CPU. And um, it depends on how passionate you are about your ideas, but it could be a good way of actually measuring how your code performs in such situations. Um, and like I said, the software benefits from the exercise. So say um, uh, the Sun uh, Spark CPUs um, have very kind of strict um, alignment requirements, so, uh, which you don't necessarily have, say, on a, on a PC. So um, while things kind of work OK on your, on your desktop computer, you may find that when you're actually trying to run on these systems, things blow up spectacularly. And uh, that just kind of feeds back into your software and makes it more robust, if not fun. Um, yeah. Um, so this is the range of systems that the NetBSD project um, supports, broken down from different families of CPUs, starting from the DEC Alpha to the families of ARM. Um, that's strong ARM um, and DEC scale. And, um, the more modern variants that you find, um, the HPPA, uh, Intel, um, the Motorola family, Big Endian and Little Endian MIPS, PowerPC, um, Hitachi Super H in Big Endian mode and Little Endian mode, 32-bit Spark, 64-bit Spark, VAX, and that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so a moment of silence for the uh, Acorn 26-bit uh, port, which um, died earlier last month. Um, it died of a severe bit rot, basically. But um, it was an interesting system because it's a 32-bit pr processor, but with a 26-bit address space. So that kind of gives it an interesting angle. Because traditionally, for Unix, you're expecting uh, a 32-bit system with um, memory management unit as your kind of requirement, um, but it, uh, due to the lack of the, these systems are kind of quite rare, and really they pretty much lived on in the educational establishments in the UK. So it's quite rare to kind of get that in the hands of developers outside. Um, so that's gone to the CVS attic now. Um, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> There's something about black obelisk, obelisks, right? <laughs> um, so this is a, a computer made uh, by Sharp and sold in Japan in the late 80s and I think early 90s. Um, it's on a similar idea as the, like the Neo Geo, which was uh, bringing the arcade experience to the home. Um, and this is a... Motorola, I think like uh, 68020 were the or original uh, systems and it went up to like 68030. Um, and this is very popular in Japan and um, if you're lucky you may get, it, uh, get your hands on it some, uh, in the other parts of the world, but it's very rare. Um, we happily uh, run on these systems um, and there's a big group of Japanese developers who actively um, make sure that uh, things run OK on this. Um, if you're not fortunate enough to kind of get your hands on one of these systems, you can get your hands on a, an emulator called the XM6i, which, as I was preparing my slides for, I uh, realized that they've, I don't know, someone's let the domain slip, so it's actually being squatted. But 
if you look on the Internet Archive, uh, xm6i.org, you can get a copy of the emulator. And so people typically run this on a Raspberry Pi and um, emulate uh, one of these systems. Um, anybody still got a Sega Dreamcast? Yay. <laughs> um, so we've, uh, the support for this has been there for quite a while. Um, the problem with this is, as with like most of these old computers, as uh, the previous speaker said, um, the hardware ends up um, becoming very pricey uh, to obtain. So we require the broadband adapter, which in reality is just uh, uh, you know, the cheaper Realtek network cards. It's just one of those in a bespoke form factor, but you can expect to pay up to like 400 pounds um, on eBay for one of these. Um, so there's various uh, projects for like kind of doing DIY, um, uh, DIY broadband adapters based on uh, you know just a standard PCI. Or actually, it might be an ISA 10 megabit network card that you put into a, a breadboard and just wire it in directly to your. Um, Dreamcast. It's not as tidy, but it's a lot cheaper than 400 quid. Um, and as I was kind of uh, looking, uh, trying to prepare the slides for this, there's actually a troll page that I found, which was basically somebody saying that if you grease your modem port and then wedge the Ethernet cable in, <laughs> you might be able to get it working if your system's aligned correctly with your PC. <laughs> um, and with most of these systems, which are you know quite old, uh, as age uh, moves forward, uh, certain things kind of start to manifest. You know, so, like uh, the lasers. In, in this case, the laser for the drive wasn't really um, built to last. You know, 15, 20 years. Uh, so one of the common things, that, again, looking on eBay, is there's usually you can pick these machines up uh, without a working uh, um, is it GD drive. Um, so there's various projects around as well, so you can actually just use um, um, a compact flash adapter and continue to kind of operate your uh, Dreamcast machine. Uh, it starts to look, uh, as these kind of projects and things pile up, your shiny nice case kind of starts to lose its uh, niceness because you just kind of grows tentacles and wires and stuff. Uh, uh, another one, does anyone know what this machine is uh, from Japan? Uh, so this is the Omeron uh, Lunar Workstation. Um, this is a, this one is a 68040 based system. Uh, this was built by a corporation in Japan in the late 80s. And uh, the significance of this machine is is that at the time when it came out, it had uh, CPM support, it had uh, MAC uh, support, and it had support for 43 BSD. Um, out of the box like natively. So uh, with one of these you can test your code all the way back to 4.3 BSD and up uh, to modern day uh, NetBSD. Um, and uh, later on just before the company imploded they also did a workstation on the Motorola 88K um, which was the processor between the 68000 and the PAL PC which didn't really take on. Um, we don't support the 68K, uh, sorry, the 88K uh, machines. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> is that the original memory? It's a lot of memory for the H. Uh, I think so, yes. Um, uh, more importantly is the resolution. Yeah. They said like, oh, the, oh, yeah. I mean, like even my laptop here, the <laughs> extremely thing, it can't even do that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so, that, but the OpenBSD guys basically took the um, R68000 port and used it as the basis for the 88000 port. And uh, these machines are interesting as well in that uh, you can replace the floppy drive with a PCMCIA adapter and then you can, you know, get it on Wi-Fi and <laughs> browse, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, this is a uh, fresh um, effort uh, going on uh, at the moment, actually. Uh, does anyone know what this board is? Uh, so this is a, 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 a Milan board, which, um, according to Wikipedia, was um, 
built by a company uh, in Germany towards the end of the 90s um, and uh, was produced until like the early 2000s. And this is a, an Atari ST clone. Um, but the difference being that um, it's got uh, PCI slots, um, ISA as well, and it can support up to 512 megabytes of RAM. Um, interesting thing is, is that it's actually got a, an Intel Triton um, chipset, which um, Intel did for the PCs uh, back in the day. Um, th the support for this actually landed uh, quite some time ago, but what I was saying about assumptions, uh, somebody assumed that you would only ever find an Intel Triton chipset on an x86 machine and basically ripped out the support for that um, in the Atari port and broke things. Um, um, but one of the, uh, Izumi Sutsui has been kind of working on this at the moment because he's just been donated a board um, and the systems um, uh, sprung back into life. It's quite impressive. Um, Actually, going back, um, according to Wikipedia, actually, there was a, also a, um, an ACP. So this is uh, the old-fashioned AT-style motherboards. Um, they actually did prototype the ACPI version, but it actually never made it to production. Um, that would have been quite cool today. Um, Amiga, we support the Amiga, but um, on the earlier systems, uh, you need something basically with an MMU. So that means that you're confined to a 68030 or up. Um, we support the 68060 as well, which is supposed to be kind of compatible with the 68040, but there's a couple of things that don't behave the same as. Um, but it's there. And as the previous speaker said, you can expect to pay lots of money for one of these accelerator boards to uh, get things going. Um, anybody remember Cobalt? <laughs> Uh, so Cobalt was a, a company that um, came around, I think, in the late 90s, and the idea was to kind of build an appliance for serving content, um, and it was kind of uh, complemented with an extremely outdated version of Linux, even for the time, and um, we run on those as well. So these appliances are typically uh, MIPS 4000-based uh, systems, um, and you can get them in various form factors. They're commonly like kind of a rack mount based um, system, but you can also get this really nice cube um, that kind of sits in your shelf um, nicely and has a, a single PCI slot. Uh, Windows CE PDAs. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, the, the actual Windows CD, uh, CE um, uh, projects went through like three generations um, of CPU architecture. The original stuff was based on MIPS, and then it moved on to the Hitachi Super H, um, and then after that, uh, it kind of died with ARM. And um, it, the ARM stuff is uh, strong ARM initially and um, uh, X scale afterwards. Uh, and we we pretty much support those. The nice thing is, is actually, again, for the, uh, from Japan, you can get these uh, really nice, uh, I think they're sharp uh, mobile phones, uh, which run the X-scale CPU. And uh, you can run NetBSD on them um, as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you were, if you're, besides the retro computing, if you actually want to do like uh, the book, build the bootloader or anything like that, you have to uh, get into a uh, bit of embedded Visual C++, which is own a style of madness. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, so we need to kind of make sure that some of this stuff actually works and not it's just not theoretical. So uh, there's a project called Anita, which is this Python-based um, framework. And uh, it basically spins up um, an instance of whatever machine has been uh, configured to, uh, boots a NetBSD ISO, uh, runs through the install process, um, and I guess runs some tests as well, um, runs the test framework, and then you know, uh, publishes the results. Um, for the Google of Summer of Code uh, last year, there was a, a project to, for, from one of the students uh, to extend the support. Uh, so I think uh, support for the 
PMAX uh, 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 port was added, uh, the HPC MIPS, the MIPS based PD PDAs was added, and um, there was a third one, but I can't remember. But I will show you on the next slide. Um, we basically have support for emulators, so these can be wired into Anita. So, um, Kimu for doing like Spark, uh, PowerPC, um, and things like that. SimH for VAX. Um, does everyone know what SimH is? Yeah. Ah. Okay. <laughs> yes, from your talk last year. That was excellent. Uh, <laughs> uh, the gentleman uh, gave a talk about uh, trying to boot NetBSD VAX and testing for po testing Postgres. Um, <laughs> um, so SimH actually started life in DEC um, in the 60s uh, for basically testing the, the PDP um, hardware and it kind of evolved from there and at some point it was um, open sourced to the world. Um, and so you can use that to boot NetBSD but you can also use it to kind of boot loads of other uh, interesting old um, operating systems like from DEC and things like that. Uh, GX Emul is an interesting emulator. It does kind of uh, MIPS. Um, it does uh, the Dreamcast, like Super H stuff, uh, um, and some other um, platforms. Uh, UAE is the uh, unsupported or no unbootable Amiga emulator. <laughs> but, uh, but then once they got the Amiga booting, uh, uh, they changed it to Unix Amiga emulator. Um, and the XMCI is the 68,000. Arcade machine uh, emulator that I was mentioning earlier on. Uh, yeah, and so that's uh, the Japanese guys. Like at most of the conferences, um, uh, have like a Raspberry Pi uh, booting uh, the emulator, and that's uh, I think like a Pi One or a Pi Two uh, with X uh, running that BSD. <laughs> Complementary hardware. Um, so. That's a, a new graphics card that came out, I think, last year, um, which supports uh, NetBSD, uh, Amiga. The developer actually worked, uh, the, the, the creator of this actually worked with um, uh, one of the NetBSD developers uh, to put the driver together. Um, so that was cool. Um, so things are still going on. Uh, he's currently actually working on a new laptop project called the Reform, uh, this kind of open source uh, secure, well, not secure, but auditable um, open hardware um, laptop that you may have heard of um, last year. Um, for your uh, VAX and other turbo channel based um, hardware, we can bring you the wonders of USB. So <laughs> you can, well, you may laugh, but you may want to get on Wi Fi with your VAX station running NetBSD. You're not going to get a turbo channel based Wi Fi adapter. Um, <laughs> uh <-huh>. Indeed. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, <laughs> the uh, the turbo channel is a bus that's found on uh, deck hardware. So the Vax uh, one generation of the Alpha and the MIPS based uh, deck stations, um, and that's uh, one of the NetBSD devs who. Uh, created um, this. Uh, uh, his new project, that was I think last year or the year before that he was doing this. Um, does anyone know what a deck denard is? <laughs> okay, <laughs> apart from the NetBSD devs in the room. <laughs> um, so deck denard was the reference um, strong arm uh, hardware platform that was created by deck um, in the late 90s. Yeah. So it's an open firmware-based uh, strong arm system. And on the board, you have this kind of um, uh, connector. Uh, and based on this connector, it's actually a PCI slot. So he's built an adapter that plugs into this. And then with that, you get PCI. So you can plug in modern um, hardware into your um, ancient strong arm um, appliance. I wanted to actually post a picture, but um, I couldn't go onto his website. It is the, the, the URL is correct, but there's some problem. Um, uh, yeah. So why would you want to do this? Um, 
it's really easy to kind of get started. Um, excuse the slides, I had this kind of weird problem, but uh, really all you need is a copy of the source code um, if you wanted to kind of experiment and build stuff, but otherwise, you know, uh, just grab an ISO and get started. But if you wanted to kind of build the OS, um, obtain the source code, um, if you run the build sh uh, list arc, you'll get the list of architectures that you can just build out of the box right there. Um, so if you wanted to kind of uh, target the next station, uh, you'd say you want the tools, and that would just go through and build the linker, compiler, and everything else that you need to kind of uh, build the OS. And then for the last one, you can say build a release and it would go through everything, build all the kernels and generate an image for you ready to play with. Um, but you don't have to go through this process, you could just download a, um, an ISO uh, from the website and uh, start playing. Um, retro blues, sadness. Um, most modern um, Wi-Fi adapters that can do WPA are card bus and that means uh, the difference between card bus and PCMCIA, though they're the same form factor, PCMCIA is basically um, an ISA card in a credit card size form factor, whereas card bus is PCI. Um, and most of these ancient pieces of hardware only do the PCMCIA. Um, so it means that you're confined to an adapter that um, can only do 802.11b and without uh, only on WEP. Um, so that kind of sucks for the PDAs, for example. Um, so though you might have a, like a modern uh, operating system that can do like IPv6 on your VAC station, uh, it's another problem when you actually want to get some software on there because uh, the way that Perl 5 um, does its build process um, means that uh, it's not possible to actually cross-compile that. Um, so basically what happens is the official documented process is that you would have a, uh, your target hardware sitting there and on your shiny fast computer you would invoke the build um, but the build would kind of SSH onto your target, do all its tests and then continue building on it which you can't really automate um, and you can't kind of fake that on, the, on your modern machine so it means You'd be surprised how, f how much you can't build if you don't have a, a version of Perl 5. Um, and it's going to be interesting if ever, uh, there ever is, ever is going to be a move to Perl 6 uh, permanently because there's a lot of stuff that just uh, won't work. Um, for the Perl 5 case, will building in an emulator help you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess so. I've not actually del de uh, delved into the... Uh, the you, could, you, know, you could set up your instance with Anita in the emulator, build ah, yes. file, get the package out, copy that. Actually, and that, that's exactly the, pro the approach that um, the FreeBSD project has taken for uh, the, the modern systems. Um, but the thing is, is actually for us, we actually have the cross-compilation support for uh, cross-building packages. It's just that we completely fall short at the Perl process because of this requirement. Um, any other questions? Uh, you had a comment uh, back there a little bit saying ensure you have a C99 compiler. I have most of these machines before 99. Uh, oh yes, uh, um, so the question was um, there's a note about a C9, C99 compiler um, aren't most of these uh, machines pre-99? Yes, uh, this is if you want to kind of cross-compile uh, from another computer. Uh, if you're actually installing a release, you would actually get a modern compiler with it. So I'm assuming that you want to experiment, like uh, you want to change something about the OS, um, uh, and you, you uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. So, um, I've had some problems on the VAX because the GCC target support has had bugs that, that get neglected. How is, how is the experience on these other platforms? Like, is that a general problem? Uh, so the question was uh, about um, toolchain support for legacy systems and uh, bit rot and uh, issues that crop up. Yes, and actually uh, this is a, a, 
a problem with some of the legacy systems uh, because as support gets uh, removed from GCC upstream, um, you're kind of in this uh, limbo. Um, the nice thing is, is uh, one of our developers, uh, Jorg, um, is actively working on LLVM support and in, re uh, in response to some of um, support for some of these architectures, they've been quite welcoming in terms of, well, yeah, sure, we can have that. Uh, I think this, a specific case was the, the 68,000 Motorola support uh, that they were happy to kind of uh, take on. I'm not sure what, the, what it means for the VAX support, but, you know. Some bug fixes for the support recently. In LLVM? In, no, in GCC. Oh. Okay. Uh, and also MIPS, uh, which apparently is a nightmare to do any sort of syscall. Uh, uh, yeah. So apparently we've uh, also received uh, GCC and uh, G, uh, GCC fixes for MIPS and VAX uh, support uh, from the audience. <coughs> uh, that's it. Thank you for listening.